This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and will be about quadratic residues. So, um, quick background, um, we're trying to study um, solutions of polynomials fx is congruent to 0 mod p, and we recall degree 1 polynomials uh, follow easily from Euclid's algorithm, and degree 2 polynomials can easily be reduced to the question of whether x squared is congruent to a mod p has a solution. Um, now, if a is not 0 and x squared is congruent to a mod p for some x, we say a is a quadratic residue. Um, so the name quadratic residue is really just a fancy way of saying it's a square. So quadratic means it's, a, uh, it's just a word for being a square, and residue means we're taking it modulo p. So this is just, quadratic residue is just a slightly long-winded way of saying it's a square modulo p. And if a is not zero and um, x squared is congruent to a has no solution, then a is a quadratic non-residue. I often forget to um, put the word quadratic in and sometimes call it a residue or a non-residue, so be warned, I might sometimes get a bit muddled. Um, so, for example, let's take p equals 7. What are the residues and what are the non-residues? So let's look at x. x can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. And the squares are 0, 1, 4, 2, 2, 4, 1. So the quadratic residues are 1, 2, and 4. And the quadratic non-residues are 3, 5, and 6. Um, and um, there's a very common piece of notation for this, which is given by the Legendre symbol. So the Legendre symbol um, for p and odd prime is defined to be 1 if a is a quadratic residue and minus 1 if a is a quadratic non-residue and 0 if a is congruent to 0 mod p. Um, this seems to be a rather funny definition. I mean, um, what on earth is the point of it? Um, well, let, let me first of all just write out what it is mod 7. So let's take p equals 7 and let a be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 or 6 modulo p. Then a p is going to be 0, plus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, minus 1. So now let's explain why we adopt such a funny definition. Um, um, very convenient because of the following properties. The first property is that a, the quadratic Legendre symbol a p, is just equal congruent to a to the p minus 1 over 2 modulo p. And um, we've actually proved this before. This is just Euler's theorem, which says that you can tell whether or not a is a square just by looking at whether this number here is plus 1 or minus 1. Um, well, as I said, we gave a proof earlier, but let's give another proof. What we do is we use the if we pick um, a primitive root g of p, so that g to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1, and g to the p minus 1 over 2 is congruent to minus 1 modulo p. And then since it's a primitive root, a is equal to g to the n for some n, unless a is equal to unless a is congruent to zero, in which case this, this result is trivial. And then we notice that a is a quadratic residue is equivalent to n being even. Um, if n is even, then this is obvious because a would be equal to g to the n over 2 squared, and you can easily check that if n is, that, 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 that 
um, the square of any element must be g to the power of something for n even. And then you can check that um, um, g to the n to the p minus 1 over 2 is congruent to plus 1 if n is even and minus 1 if n is odd. A fairly easy calculation. So that shows that a is a that, that, that a is a quadratic residue if and only if a is equal to g to the n for n even so so that this formula here holds. Um, another property is that the Legendre symbol is a homomorphism from um, z modulo pz star, the non-zero residues, to a little group with two elements, plus one and minus one. So this obviously um, raises the question, what do we mean by homomorphism? Well, a homomorphism is just a complicated way of saying it preserves multiplication. So this means f of a b has to be f of a times f of b. And we can show this is a homomorphism in two ways. First of all, we can just notice that a Legendre symbol a p is just congruent to mine to um, a to the p minus one over two, and it's kind of obvious that a b to the p minus one over two is congruent to a to the p minus one over two times b to the p minus one over two. Well. That proof um, uses the existence of a primitive root, so it sort of works, but you remember primitive roots are kind of tricky. Um, so we can also give a proof of this um, without using primitive roots, just by counting carefully. What we notice is that exactly half of all non-zero residue classes So that the, the non-zero residues will be 1, 2, op p minus 1, are squares or quadratic residues. And that's because the map um, x goes to x squared. Um, it has the problem that minus x also goes to x squared. So if a is a quadratic residue, it has exactly two square roots. Remember, a is non-zero, so, so it, it can't have just one square root. So that means that every number is the square of either zero or two numbers modulo p, which means the number that are squares must be exactly half of these. So there are p minus one over two quadratic residues. So if you pick a number at random, there's about a 50% chance that it's a square, as long as it's not actually divisible by p. And that means that there are also p minus 1 over 2, and which is equal to p minus, so p minus 1 minus p minus 1 over 2, non, um, quadratic non-residues. Or maybe non-quadratic residues, I don't quite know which is best. So that means if we've got the quadratic residues, um, then um, we can look at the quadratic non-residues. And suppose we take A to be a quadratic residue, then, then we, we, we note that the multiplication, multiplication by A takes quadratic residues to quadratic re non-residues. In, in fact, there are two in fact, we've really got to prove three things. We've got to prove that a quadratic residue times a quadratic residue is a quadratic residue, which is trivial. And we've got to show that a quadratic residue times a quadratic non-residue is a quadratic non-residue. And this is easy because if, the, if, if this was a quadratic residue, then this would be the quotient of that by that, so it would also be a quadratic residue. Finally, we've got to show that a quadratic non-residue times a quadratic non-residue is a quadratic residue. And this is a little bit, this, this is the tricky part. So we notice that this isn't actually always true in general. Um, it's true for something like the reals, because they're the um, a non-square would be something negative, and if you multiply two negative numbers by each other, you get something positive, which is a square. On the other hand, if you work with the rationals, you can notice that two is not a square, 
And if you multiply it by 3 is not a square, you get 6, which is also not a square. So there's no reason in general why the product of two things that are not squares should suddenly be a square. However, this does work modulo p. And we notice that multiplication by a non-residue, so a quadratic non-residue, must actually be an isomorphism. That's because the number of quadratic residues is the same as the number of quadratic resi non-residues, and this is injective, so it must be surjective. This means that if b is a quadratic non-residue, then b is equal to x times a for x of quadratic residue, because the map from quadratic residues to quadratic non-residues is onto when you're multiplying by b. Now this means that a times b is equal to a times x times a, which is a quadratic residue, because it's a square a squared times another quadratic residue x. So here with a and b are any two quadratic non-residues, and you see their product is a quadratic residue. Um, now, um, third property, we know what whether or not minus 1 is a quadratic residue. So we saw earlier that this is equal to plus 1 if p is congruent to 1 mod 4, and minus 1 if p is congruent to 3 mod 4. So we've proved this earlier. We can also prove it by Euler's criterion. So we can notice that um, minus 1 p is congruent to minus 1 p minus 1 over 2 modulo p. Um, and um, this is equal to this is this exponent is even if p is one mod four and it's odd if p is mo is three mod four so that, that 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 gives us this is plus one for p congruent to three mod four and minus one if p is congruent to sorry that should be a one p is one mod four and it's minus one if p is congruent to three mod four um now if we look at this we notice that minus 1p has the property that depends only on p mod something. So in this particular case, the something happens to be equal to 4. Um, and that's rather surprising because there's no obvious reason why whether something is a square mod p should depend on p mod something. Well, that suggests we ask the following question. So we can ask, does a p for fixed a depend on p mod something um, where this something is something we're going to have to determine well the, the, the next simplest case is to take a equals 2 so so let's take a look at this so we can ask what is a when is a a quadratic residue of Sorry, when is a so when is two a quadratic residue of p? So let's look at um, some data. Let's take p equals three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen, seventeen, nineteen, twenty-three, twenty-nine, and thirty-one, and try and check to see whether or not um, two is a square. Well, 3 and 5, it's very easy to check it isn't. 2, 7, yes, because 2 is congruent to 3 squared. So let's put a tick there. 11, you can check it isn't. 13, it isn't. Um, 17, it actually is, because 2 is congruent to 6 squared. 36 is 2 mod 17, so we put a tick there. 19, nothing works. 23, yes, because 2 is congruent to 5 squared. Um, um, 29, you can check it's not. 31... Yes, because 2 is congruent to 8 squared. That 64 is 2 modulo 31. And now let's see, um, um, does it depend on P mod 4? Well, no, because um, 2 is not a square mod 3, and it is a square mod 7, and 7 is congruent to 3 modulo 4. So this idea fails. Um, that doesn't so it's not looking very promising but let's try mod 8 and then you notice that if p is 1 mod 8 well what primes we've got 1 mod 8 well we've got 17 so um 1 mod 8 yes 
what about 3 mod 8? Well, here we've got 3, no 11, um, no 19, no. So 3 mod 8, it never seems to be a quadratic residue. What about 5 mod 8? Well, there we have no um, 13, no um, um, 29, no. So that seems to be no. And 7, we get 7, yes. Um, 31, yes. So we it it seems to be consistent with the idea that 2 is a quadratic residue for primes that are 1 or 7 mod 8. So we can provisionally say, what about 2p is equal to plus 1 if p is congruent to 1 or 7, and minus 1 if p is congruent to 3 or 5? Let's put a question mark because we haven't proved this yet. Um, well, now we want to show this is in fact correct. Um, so in order to do that, we're going to have to use Gauss's lemma. So let's say what Gauss's lemma is. Gauss's lemma gives us this neat formula for the Legendre symbol AP. It's equal to minus 1 to the n, where n is given in the following funny way. So n is the number of residue classes um, a 2a up to p minus 1 over 2a. So this is sort of half of all multiples of a. And it's the number of residue classes that are congruent to something between p over 2 and p mod p. Um, well, this looks like a rather funny criterion. Um, so um, in order to get used to it, let's do a couple of examples. So let's first of all work out whether or not 2 is a quadratic residue of 17. So what we do is we take half of all the multiples of 2. So we take 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16. And now um, there are p minus 1 over 2 of these, so that's we, we take the first 8 multiples of 2. And now what we do is we take a look at which of them are between p over 2 and p when you reduce mod p. And as we notice, there are just 4 of them. So Gauss's lemma says that 217 is equal to minus 1 to the 4, which is plus 1. So 2 is a quadratic residue, mod 17, which we saw earlier. It's congruent to 6 squared. So let's do another slightly more complicated example. That, that, this was easy because all the multiples of 2 were, were less than p. So if we try something like 7, 17, this is a little bit more complicated. So let's take the multiples of 7. We take the first 8 multiples, so we get 7, 14, 21, 28, 35, 42, 49, and 56. That's eight of them. And then we reduce modulo 17. So we get 7, 14, and then we get 4, 11, and that's 1, 8, 15, um, 5. And now, which of them are between... Um, um, set we want 17 over 2 is less than... x is less than 17. 17 over 2 is about um, 8.5, so we see there's that one, and there's that one, and there's that one, and the number of these is 3. So 7, 17 is equal to minus 1 to the 3, which is equal to minus 1. So this tells us 17 is not a square, so 7 is not a square modulo 17. Well, you may be thinking that Gauss's criterion is actually completely useless because in order to test whether 17 is a, 7 is a square mod 17, we have to test 17, about 17 over two different cases. And this is no faster than squaring the first 17 over two numbers and see whether any of them are equal to 7. However, the key point is that it turns out to be possible to count the number of, of these classes um, it, 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 uh, quite directly. And um, um, what I'll do is we'll first prove Gauss's lemma and then show how to use it to work out um, numbers like this much more, much faster. 
So the idea of Gauss's lemma is um, the numbers from 1 up to p minus 1 consist of p minus 1 over 2 pairs, 1 p minus 1, 2 p minus 2, and in general these are going to be all a minus a, or when I say minus a I mean something congruent to minus a. And what we're going to do is to multiply together one element from each of these pairs. And there's one obvious way of doing it. We can take 1 times 2 times 3 times up to p minus 1 over 2. Um, alternatively, we could take our number a and multiply it by, and, and multiply a times 1 um, times 2a times 3a times p minus 1 over 2a. And these numbers are not equal, they're equal up to some sign. And um, the numbers from um, a up to p minus 1 over 2a contain one element from each of these p minus 1 over 2 pairs, because we've got p minus 1 over 2 numbers, and you can easily check that none of them are uh, equal to minus and plus or minus another one modulo p. So um, um, in order to change all these numbers to numbers from 1 to p minus 1, we've got to multiply all the ones between p plus 1 over 2 and p by minus 1. So we should have a factor of minus 1 to the n, where n is the number of elements 1a, 2a, and so on, congruent to something between p over 2 and p mod p. Um, and now we can just cancel out this, this product, the, the product of the numbers from 1 up to p minus 1, which you see we've also got here. And we find that 1 is congruent to um, a to the p minus 1 over 2 times minus 1 to the n modulo p. And now this thing here we know is equal to a p by Euler's theorem. And um, if one of these two numbers is plus one, the other must be plus one. And if one is minus one, the other must be minus one. So this must also be equal to, to, um, to the Legendre symbol. So we've proved Gauss's lemma that the Legendre symbol is equal to minus one to this rather funny number n. Um, and now we will show that this is actually a really good way of calculating Legendre symbols. First of all, I need to define some notation. We're going to define um, x in square brackets to be the integer part of x. And you've got to be a bit careful what this means. This means that x is equal to the integer part of x plus something... Um, 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 from 0 to 1. More, more precisely, the something, let's call it the something, the remainder should be 0, should be less than or equal to the remainder, and the remainder should be strictly less than 1. For example, if we take the integer part of pi, this is equal to 3, and if we take the integer part of 7, this is just equal to 7, and if we take the integer part of minus pi, this is equal to minus 4, not minus 3. You've got to be really careful here, because if you try asking your calculator or computer what the integer part of minus pi is, it will quite likely to tell you that the integer part is minus 3. But if you think about it, we said that the leftover bit has to be between 0 and 1, not between 0 and minus 1 if the number is negative. So, so watch out for this. Um, this is a sort of common source of errors when you're trying to program calculators to do number theory, that, that, that they get the integer part wrong. Um, so um, now, now using this notation, um, we can now work out whether or not 2 is a quadratic residue of p. So this is equal to minus 1 to the n, where n is the number of um, numbers um, 1 times 2, 2 times 2, 3 times 2, up to p minus 1 over 2 times 2, which is just 2, 4, 6, up to p minus 1, that are between p over 2 and p. And you see it's rather nice because all these numbers are already 
less than p, so we don't have to reduce them mod p. And how many of them are between 0 and p over 2 and p? Well, the number is the total number of these things, which is p minus 1 over 2 minus the number between um, 0 and p over 2. And that is p minus 1 over 2 minus, well, the number of these between 0 and p over 2 is just the integer part of p divided by 4. And by the way, don't confuse this with a Legendre symbol. This, this means we divide p by 4 and then take the integer part of it. Whereas if I said p4, um, this would be a Legendre symbol, except Legendre symbols aren't defined for, for the number 4. So this would make no sense at all. So now what we're going to do is to try and work out this expression for all values of p. And we need to know, we need to know minus 1 to the n. So we want to know, are these odd or even? And this is a little bit complicated. And if you think about it a bit, you'll see that whether or not these are odd or even depends on what p is mod 8. So let's try putting p equals 8m plus 1, or 8m plus 3, or 8m plus 5, or 8m plus 7. And then we will work out what is p minus 1 over 2. And here we get 4m 4m plus 1, 4m plus 2, 4m plus 3, so we know that mod 8. And then we want to work out the fractional part of p divided by 4. And you can see the fractional part is, sorry, the integer part will be 2m. Here it will again be 2m, 2m plus 1, and 2m plus 1. And now we have p minus 1 over 2 minus p over 4. Is now going to be 2m, 2m plus 1, 2m plus 1, and 2m plus 2. And you see these two are odd and these two are even, so minus 1 to the n is going to be plus 1, minus 1, minus 1, or plus 1. And by Gauss's lemma, this is equal to 2p. So by looking at this, we now see that 2 is a quadratic residue of p if p is congruent to 1 or 7 mod 8. You, you can also write this as p is congruent to plus or minus 1. And it's minus 1 if p is congruent to 3 or 5 mod 8, which you can think of as p not congruent to plus or minus 1, which may be a little bit easier to remember. So um, now we will have an application of this. In fact, I'll give an application to Mersenne prime. So you recall a Mersenne prime is a prime of the form 2 to the p minus 1, um, in, where, where, where p is prime. Um, in general, um, it's kind of difficult, it's not very easy to test whether 2 to the p minus 1 is prime if p is large, but there's one very simple test you can do using uh, the quadratic residue symbol. Um, so we recall that if a prime q divides 2 to the p minus 1, then q is congruent to 1 modulo p, because um, 2 has order p modulo q, so p must divide the number of non-zero residue classes mod, mod q. Um, and this means that q must be equal to p plus 1, 2p plus 1, 3p plus 1, or 4p plus 1, and so on. However, q is... Um, necessarily odd, unless p is very small, so we can cross off p plus 1, which is even, and 3p plus 1, which is even, and we see the smallest possibility is 2p plus 1. So we can ask, when um, does q equals 2p plus 1 divide 2 to the p minus 1? And we have a simple criterion for it. If two, if if p and 2p plus 1 are both prime and p is common to 3 mod 8, then q equals 2p plus 1 divides 2 to the p minus 1. So 2 to the p minus 1 is not prime. 
So just before proving this, let's look at some examples. Um, um, I should have said uh, p has to be greater than 3 here, because if p is equal to 3, this proof doesn't uh, this breaks down. I mean, um, 2p plus 1 does indeed divide it, but 2p plus 1 turns out to be equal to 2 to the p minus 1 if p equals 3. So 2 to the 3 minus 1 equals 2 times 3 plus 1. So 2 to the 3 minus 1 is actually prime. Well, so, so examples apart from p equals 3, we can get p equals 11. So 2 to 11 minus 1 is divisible by 23, as we saw earlier, which is 2p plus 1. Um, Another example would be p equals 83. So we see 2 to the 83 minus 1 is divisible by um, 167, which is 2 times 83 plus 1. And I, I think you'll agree, if you didn't know this, it really wouldn't be at all obvious that 2 to the 83 minus 1 is divisible by 167. It'd be a, a rather tiresome calculation, even using Russian peasant multiplication to, to check this. Um, now let's show why this is true. Um, well, if p is congruent to 3 mod 8, this implies that q, which is equal to 2p plus 1, is congruent to um, 7 mod 8. So 2 is a quadratic residue. Of q. So... 2 to the q minus 1 over 2 is congruent to plus 1 modulo q. This is just Euler's criterion for when numbers are quadratic residues. Well, q minus 1 over 2 is just p, so 2 to the p is congruent to plus 1 mod p, so mod q, sorry. So 2 to the p minus 1 is congruent to 0 mod q, which is just the same as saying that q divides 2 to the p minus 1. Um, OK, so um, next um, video, I'll be doing more examples of using Gauss's lemma to compute quadratic residues.